Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am very sorry I couldn't make it in person. I was really hoping to maybe make the trip out and uh, enjoy the lovely weather this time of year. Uh, but alas, I will give this uh, from my home here in Illinois in the U.S. Um, I do apologize if some of the things I say are slightly U.S. centric. Uh, I do live here, so it is the frame of reference I have. Uh, but yeah, so I just want to talk today about the benefits of IPv6 for software deployment. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a, I get paid by the word in my title. So uh, I'm a full stack network automation software engineer uh, at the Energy Sciences Network, which is part of the U.S. Department of Energy and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, if I say more words, uh, I will get paid even more. So real quick, just kind of go into an overview of what we'll be talking about here. So I want to talk about just briefly what ESNet is and what a RNE network is. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar uh, with that already. However, uh, I think that background is useful as to why we are uh, very interested in IPv6 and why we're uh, been we, why we've been big adopters of v6 since the very very early days. Um, I want to talk, of course, about how v6 can help you as a software developer. Uh, so if you are writing an application, uh, how is doing this in a v6 world going to be better and not just this new thing I have to do that's a pain. Uh, I want to talk about some traps and pitfalls because, well, you do have to think about how you're doing things and it's not just uh, unicorns and ponies, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, give some tips and tricks uh, just that I've run into as a developer uh, writing in a V6 environment. And then, of course, yeah, sum it up and uh, sounds like we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, but I won't drag things on to get in the way of T. So briefly, what is ESNet? So this is our ESNet 6 network. Uh, this is the latest generation of our network. Uh, we run an international network that is uh, essentially focused on providing the uh, US Department of Energy's uh, high energy particle physics uh, interests to CERN and other uh, international research institutions. So it's basically a big fast network for doing some science stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people here are representing little clouds here. Uh, you know, you have your ISPs, your content providers. Uh, there's kind of a big one that's hosting this that we might know about. Uh, not Google, but, you know, Meta, you know, things like that. These are all networks. There's a lot of them. Um, they all connect to the internet. However, there's this kind of blue bubble of RNE networks. So that's research and education networks. So these research and education networks are uh, basically high speed purpose built networks for science and education purposes. And so they're a little bit different. Uh, and so that has allowed us to do maybe some unique things. And I think that the IPv6 adoption has been uh, very high in research and education very early on um, at ESNet. Our, uh, our allocation is pretty much the first one in the Aaron region. Uh, so we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, yeah, uh, essentially, you know, you have these purpose-built networks like ESNet uh, or like the, you know, bullet train and maybe a normal ISP is more of a general use thing. So IPv6, uh, because of our purpose-built network, it's a little easier perhaps for us to deploy IPv6. And so that's why we have a lot of decades at this point <laughs> of experience with v6. Um, yeah, so how can v6 help you? Obviously, we want to know what we can get out of this thing. So uh, the first kind of topic that the first theme I found when thinking through this was uh, it really eases, it makes it a little easier to develop and manage uh, your applications. Uh, and of course, your networks, uh, just a little background about me, I actually have been a network engineer for a long time, but now I write automation software. Uh, so I will probably switch quite a bit into uh, just talking about network management because it is still a passion of mine. Uh, but yeah, there's no NAT to worry about. So obviously, if you're running a network, that's great. Uh, running NAT appliances is a pain, troubleshooting stinks and all that stuff. But if you're running an application, uh, NAT traversal, for example, is really hard. Uh, I've linked this out here in the references uh, to a post by Tailscale about uh, they've just basically gone and categorized all the various types of NAT that you might find and all of the ways that you might actually uh, get through and punch holes through those NAT barriers. And it's really complicated. It's amazing how much, uh, how much complexity in code they've had to write uh, to, to basically be able to uh, simulate end-to-end -end connectivity in a world where you're blocked by stateful devices and uh, most of that's NAT. So, you know, if you're developing an application that needs to have these kinds of, of communication, then getting rid of that whole NAT problem space clears you up to just have way less problems to solve and uh, less problems are better. Um, in, connect, in, in connectivity in general, 
uh, kind of on the same vein, it just reduces a lot of complexity, right? Because the internet was originally designed so that a device could talk to a device and that was it. So bringing that back with V6, which is something we've lost um, with a V4 world uh, with NAT uh, is really powerful. Um, and I, I think it's interesting just as a bit of a, maybe an anecdote uh, for me and, and perhaps my generation of engineers, we kind of grew up in a world where end-to-end -end connectivity wasn't assumed. And so there's kind of a, an education battle, I think, to, to go through and prove out that, well, actually, yeah, it, 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 the internet is supposed to be end-to-end -end first. It's not supposed to be hiding behind NAT. And there's a lot of folks that think NAT's security and things like that. So, you know, that's one of the struggles you'll find even working with developers uh, is that, well, wait, my application's just available. You know, it's publicly accessible. There's not necessarily this, you know, NAT in the, in the way of things. It, it can be a little bit of a, uh, of a mindset shift. Um, uh, there's another citation here, uh, that goes into, uh, I believe Scott Hogue, uh, from Hexabuild wrote this post for Infoblox, but, uh, it talks about how, uh, V6 often has lower latency than V4, um, which of course, if your network connectivity has lower latency, that can ultimately re result in uh, better performance and of course, hopefully customer satisfaction. So, uh, it's kind of interesting that V6 would have lower latency. Um, but a lot of that again, comes down to the, the big elephant in the room, which is Nat and uh, Nat having to basically be involved in every, every, uh, every flow. It just, it slows things down and is noticeable. Um, one of my, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, not at the SNet, but us outside, uh, Kevin Myers talks a lot and he works a lot in the ISP space. And actually one of the big pushes that they have seen for v6 has been gamers because they care about latency for you know their video games and stuff like that so it's interesting to see that there is a lot of evidence towards uh lower latency in ipv6 there's actually a talk uh, linked out in that blog post from a uh within facebook only uh engineer talking about how facebook was seeing lower latency uh pretty much across the board for people uh connecting over ipv6 um, another thing that makes just running your application a lot easier is that you can actually see the real IP addresses. Uh, so in your logs, you can actually see what's connecting to what, and you don't have to go, okay, I see this IP address of the firewall that is connected to us. And this is masqueraded by this NAT. And I can now, I now have to go to this system and correlate that and correlate this, you know, being able to see just the actual IP addresses just removes one layer of indirection, which, uh, when you're troubleshooting already complex software, it's nice to remove as many bits of complexity as possible. So another theme that I think is important is cost savings. Uh, so if you are developing for IPv6 only, uh, which of course is a big if, but um, even if you are still doing uh, mostly IPv6 or some IPv6, there are still cost savings to be had just by developing with uh, v6 in mind. Um, so cloud service providers are starting to charge for v4. Uh, this link points out to uh, Amazon. I think they're charging like five tenths of a US uh, cent per hour, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it really does add up. Um, now, obviously that's for your public uh, IP addresses and things like that, but you know, every cost adds up, especially in a cloud environment. So, you know, if, if you don't need that V4 connectivity or you can minimize that V4 connectivity, you can really start to, to save uh, some money on that front. Uh, like I mentioned and alluded to a bit earlier, just having end-to-end -end connectivity makes troubleshooting easier. Uh, when troubleshooting is easier, then uh, you know your time to resolution during an incident is lower, uh, and that typically just results in less cost across the board. Uh, you know, less people hours being spent on troubleshooting complicated things and and stuff of that sort. Um, the other really big one that I think is important is that you get to change from V4 to V6 on your own timeline. So if you start now you get to change over on your terms. If you wait, there's gonna be a tipping point where you are gonna be forced to change to V6, not on your own terms, because either somebody's now gonna not have V4 and they're upset that they can't get to your, your application, or um, you know, uh, you're trying to do business with an entity that doesn't have V4 anymore. And they're like, well, we're not gonna pay you for your business application you've written or whatever it is, right? So. If you do it now, uh, you can you can do it in a very controlled and well planned out manner. If you do it later, it's going to be rushed, right? You're going to be kind of forced into it. So it's to me, I think the question of whether or not you know you'll have to move to v6. I think that's I think that's gone. Um, of course, I'm a bit biased, but I, I do believe that you're going to have to move things to v6 at some point. 
you might as well do it now uh, before uh, it's done for you. Um, another broad theme is just aligning with various rules and regulations. Uh, if you want your application to be in the Apple App Store, it's got to work in an IPv6 only environment. That is a requirement. Uh, other app stores don't quite have the same uh, requirements, but I could see them starting to do so. Um, but also there's the whole topic of government uh, regulations, right? So again, US centric thing, but the US federal government, if you want to work with us, you're going to have to run V6. Um, so if you're selling a service to the US federal government, uh, there's this mandate that is saying, yeah, uh, we're going to be IP physics, IPv6 only 80% uh, in not too long. So it's, it's kind of one of those things that goes back to the point of your hand being forced into doing this. Um, you're going to have to comply with those regulations at some point, whether you're under that governing body or if you're just interacting with them uh, for other reasons. And like I say here, you know, many governing bodies, uh, aside from the U.S., have started making V6 a requirement at various layers. Uh, China, India, uh, the EU uh, kind of pushes that on the member states, but uh, there's all a lot of policies around there that push V6 in various things. And those, I, to me, the trend seems to be that they are increasing over time. Uh, so... If you want to align with rules and regulations, which typically is a good thing, then you probably should get on the V6 train. Um, another theme that I think I see a bit is that it's a good excuse to fix some technical debt. Um, it's, it can be kind of hard to convince um, people within your organization sometimes to, to fix problems in your code. However, V6 might force your hand a bit on that. So if you've been hard coding IPs in your, in your code base, right, which I think is generally considered a bad practice, but it works, so why bother? Well, if you have a push to start doing IPv6 support in your application, well, you're going to have to fix that. So it's a great excuse to kind of fix that. Um, if you are using an old version of a library that hasn't been updated for a while, but again, it's working, it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, if you have to now move to a version that supports v6, um, V6 API endpoints, things of that sort. You know, this is a great this is a great time to go ahead and, and refactor those bits of your code as well. Um, got that home that home built parsing engine that parses IP addresses for you that you just can't stand, but it's this you know ten thousand character regex that somebody wrote and nobody dare touch. Well, <laughs> it's time to it's time to move on. It's time to move that out to a library that can handle that appropriately and things like that. Uh, still storing your IP addresses as strings in your database. Well, uh, it's a great time to fix that. You know, move to the proper IP uh, types in, in your actual database storage. It'll be more efficient, more faster, more faster. Uh, it'll be faster. Um, it'll just be, you know, the right thing to do. Um, when you're doing these transitions from V4 to V6, it's a great chance to do that. Uh, you have, you know, you're misusing sockets perhaps in your application. Uh, great time to move that to support, you know, multiple IP layers. And it's typically pretty easy. Uh, it's, it's abstracted for you. Um, in those socket APIs and system API calls. All right, uh, a few traps and pitfalls uh, that I've seen. So development environments are kind of a hard one. So if you are, for example, in an IPv6 only world, uh, Docker can still have some issues, especially if your developers are using Macs. Um, it can, it's surprising how bad the support can be sometimes. So while it's great and easy on Linux and it runs in production just fine, your local development, if you're running those containers on your machines, you know, you might run into a few speed bumps there. Uh, we've seen as we've started to delve into the Kubernetes world uh, that some of the third-party applications we want to add uh, do seem to lag in V6, but of course the core is obviously fine. Uh, Google obviously runs it and they are very big V6 proponents. Um, but the general sentiment among many developers there has been kind of the, oh, just turn off V6 if you're having a problem still. So we still see that uh, kind of old way of thinking about IPv6 uh, per, uh, proliferating through that world. So it's just something to be cautious of. Uh, our goals are to run uh, Kubernetes in a v6-only environment. Um, so I think it's very possible, but it's maybe a, a path slightly less trodden by others, right? So you got to be cautious. Um, if, you're, if you're stuck in the enterprise IT world, many of them still muck about with v6 in all sorts of fun ways. Um, you know, there's a great thread going on on, I think it's v6ops mailing list right now about option 108 and how the attempt to use that at the uh, Cynet SC network uh, supercomputing conference was was used recently. Um, you know, that's a good example of how 
if you're a developer and trying to move to a v6 only environment maybe some of the the corporate it policies that are imposed on you might be a little backwards around ipv6 maybe it, there's odd firewall policies in place uh, just because it hasn't been tested by other people in the organization um there can also just be delay in infrastructure teams rolling v6 out to uh, data centers right so, it, so this applies to both cloud providers as we saw earlier in a talk um you know you go to the checkbox to an interface and you try to turn on v6 and you're like oh there's only ipv4 uh and maybe on your on-premise uh data on-premises data centers you're going to have uh you know oh wow v6 we haven't done that yet and so you know getting your applications to run there well you know if you don't have v6 on the servers it's got to be done in conjunction uh with those teams github that's yeah, a big one uh, they still are uh lagging on ipv6 um and i don't feel bad calling them out about that because it's been uh, going on for a long time though they are working on it uh very dutifully but that will cause you problems if your development uh environment is or your build process is on a v6 only network you have to have a translation mechanism to talk to github uh which is fine but uh, or you have to proxy, you know, those repositories somehow. So there's there's a lot of just assumption that V4 is going to be present in some way, shape, or form in all of these development environment tooling uh, systems. So uh, another theme is just kind of the impact of, you know, the various V6 deployment methods. Um, it might be very surprising uh, how source address selection works, ULA. <clears throat> is a great example of this. Uh, and that will really surprise people, right? So maybe they'll go to, you know, try out V6 and they'll think that it's working just fine because oh, I've got V6 enabled and I've got V4 enabled, but somebody used ULA. Well, that ULA address is not gonna be used and you are not actually testing the V6 code paths um, if you're using DNS addresses and things like that. So uh, it can be a little bit surprising. Um, there's a lot of V6 deployment methods out there. V6 only, mostly dual stack, CLAT, XLAT. I could go on and on with a list of things that exist. They all do behave slightly differently and have different implications uh, for your application. So you have to be you know, cognizant of these uh, deployment methods when you're writing your software. Um, V6 really implies having multiple IP addresses per device. Uh, that's new to a lot of people, you know. Um, Maybe banking software is a good example of this where, you know, they'll lock your session down to an IP address. And if you start connecting from multiple IPs, they might lock your session down because it's way more secure to do it that way or things like that. So you have to make sure that your, your software that you're writing is capable of supporting, you know, uh, basically decoupling user identity from IP addresses, which I would argue is a good thing, but, um, you know, it can be, it can be new for a lot of folks. So you got to work through that. Um, since V6 uh, was designed to be kind of ships in the night with IPv4, uh, you might have different data paths. So you might be taking one physical path uh, for IPv4 and another physical path for IPv6. Now, that could result in lower latency and better connectivity. That could result in packet loss on one and not the other. Maybe your V6 path is great and your V4 path is having packet loss. Now you have to troubleshoot the fact that, you know, your customers... Some of them are seeing packet loss, some of them aren't, or some are seeing performance issues, some aren't, and it'll get really confusing really quick. So that's just kind of one of the things that you have to think about is, well, are our routing topologies on our network that delivers this application or, or outside of our control, you know, our internet providers, are they the same? How do we make sure that our applications have enough observability built in to see if that's impacting us? So there'd be dragons just in general. Uh, IPv4 you can very easily enumerate it, right? IP6, so much. Uh, this is when I really learned and felt for the first time uh, the implications of big O problems uh, was when I had written a bit of software to just generate uh, DNS entries for some IP addresses. And I started off, I was like, okay, make it work. And I did it with IPv4 addresses. Then I fed it uh, the IPv6 uh, prefix that we were gonna use for this and my computer round to a halt. And I was like, what is going on? Oh, well, I was trying to iterate over every address. It worked real great when there's 255, not so great when there was some 4 billion or more addresses. Um, additionally, if you hard code your addresses with V6, like you maybe did with V4, it's going to bite you. Don't hard code things. We have this awesome thing called DNS. It's really cool. Read about it. If you haven't seen it, it's awesome. Uh, don't hard code things. Don't assume that there's a single address family. 
Till we disable v4, then go on because we'll definitely never have IPv7 or 8 or anything like that. Um, and, and finally, give both address families uh, equal attention. It's really easy. And that goes back to the point about me, you know, writing my very naive DNS allocator script. Uh, I just didn't think that there would be a difference between v4 and v6 when I wrote it. And I wrote v4 first, and therefore I had problems. It's going to be very easy to do that in your application. You know, if you're doing some operation, you might think, oh, you know, this is easy to do. I tested it, it works. Then when you apply v6 to it, it's going to break. So finally here, just a few tips and tricks I've learned. Um, here's just some of those. Uh, inputs and validations. You got to support multiple address families, right? If you've written a form that accepts an IP address, well, now you got to support multiple formats. And maybe you don't want to accept all types there. So there's a little bit more complexity there just to be aware of. If you're displaying addresses, if you've just been displaying the value returned from the database, well, all of a sudden something that was this big is now this big because you know you have 128 bits versus just 32. Uh, you know things take up a bit more space. Make sure your libraries can be dynamic enough to handle that. Um, your tests, we do have those, right? Make sure that they cover v6 and all the v6 bits of your code path, and make sure that it's actually working, which is um, harder than you might think. Like I mentioned with ULA, for example, um, when monitoring. You do have that, right? Uh, your application health. Uh, make sure to monitor both paths, right? Like I mentioned, uh, v6 and v4 can come from completely different physical network paths. Make sure that your monitoring is aware. That way, you can see where those issues lie. Uh, uh, where those issues lie when they inevitably come up. Um, your logging output. Make sure that you know if you're logging information around addresses uh, that you are logging both address families and not just logging only v4. Um, I've seen that one. Another thing that's just a general good thing to do is recognize that IPv6 is big. There's a lot of it. And that opens you up to a lot of opportunities that just might not have been available to you in v4. Um, now, I know most people probably know this, but most people probably know that v6 is really large. But just as an example here, uh, Ed Horley wrote this, I think, back in 2015. Um, basically, he wrote this scenario where you would have uh, 10 million containers every second grabbing a brand new v6 address and throwing it away, never reusing it. If you were to allocate a slash 48, it would take you 3.8 billion years to consume that. So there's a lot of space available. Don't translate your IPv4 views into v6, right? Don't try to be, you know, stingy with addresses and, uh, you know, try to fit as many things onto one address as possible. Use that to your advantage. Um, anyway, I'll stop ranting about how great IP6 is for being big. Uh, testing, some tips around testing. Uh, make sure you test in all the deployment scenarios. So, you know, if you're going to be serving up your application to people on mobile networks, see how it works on a, you know, maybe a, a an XLAT network uh, and stuff like that. Um, one, that can be a little difficult, but one cool thing that I've linked out here is there is a uh, Aaron grant recently handed out to uh, colleagues of mine at Internet2, uh, which is another US network, uh, to do these IPv6 test pods. So they're actually developing these little uh, devices that you can maybe ship out to somebody who's writing an application. They'll plug a computer into it and you can you know, change the settings on the box to be, uh, I want IPv6 only, and it'll let you run your tests through that environment. I want you know, XLAT run your tests. I want you know, dual stack. I want IPv6 mostly and all these things. So that could be a pretty cool uh, development for people who need to test these things, um, you could also build your own, right? So keep an eye on that space. Uh, I think it's a pretty cool idea. Um, and your security tools. Make sure that those are looking at v6 as well. Um, it's it's uh, very easy to forget that you have this whole other entry point in your application. So you know, make sure that you're working closely with security teams uh, to uh, make sure that you're not just serving up stuff that you don't mean to. All right. You're almost free of me. So conclusions. Write your software for the future. It is here. So, you know, there's no time like the present to implement v6. Don't dilly-dally. Make it happen. Uh, why buy two protocols when you can have one for half the price? Uh, that's a reference to Contact, a great film. Um, but it's, it's really, I think, an important point, which is developing for one address family is easier than developing for two, right? And I think that a lot of people have been scared to move to v6 because, well, now I have to kind of develop for two things. Now, with the right API abstractions and, and things like that, it is not 
this it's not double the work to develop for two address families, but it is it is somewhat more work. So, you know, work towards turning off v4 because if you can move to a v6 only world then your development will be easier and push other parts of your organization to do so um which leads into the next point which is that translation mechanisms are mature so you could actually ask your it people to turn off v4 and things are probably going to work pretty well uh, you'd be surprised um the office network i'm not at uh the office at the moment but the office network i work off of my machine does not get an IPv4 address and even using v4 only resources, it's essentially seamless. The only time I have problems are uh, with hard coded um, IPv4 addresses in, uh, you know, poorly written pieces of software, which we try to minimize as much as possible. But even then there's workarounds with CLAT and things like that. Um, like I mentioned with all the tips and tricks and potential pitfalls, you know, be careful uh, with how you're doing it. Don't just turn it on and run away. But don't be scared either. Like it's not hard, uh, it's not impossible. Other people have done it, and you have support. Um, the IPv6 community is great, as evidenced by everyone here showing up, um, and people are generally willing to help. In my experience, and finally, I would just say use v6 on your terms. Don't wait till you're forced to. That's always been the biggest thing for me as to why people should be doing IPv6 now. Um, is you're gonna have to do it at some point. Do it now while you can plan it appropriately, versus when somebody forces you to do it. So anyway, just want to open it up to questions now. Uh, I cannot throw the cube, so perhaps I will <laughs> Great. ask Thanks someone to throw much, it on my behalf. Um, Chris. Before you leave the room, oh, applause first. Um, yeah, so please don't leave the room. We have changed our minds again. We're going to run with Bruno. No, we're not going to run with Bruno next. Okay. We've changed our mind again, again. <laughs> so sorry, Chris. There's a little thing going on here. So, questions for Chris, sorry. I've got one down here with Nick. Hello, um, Docker and Kubernetes are, are much newer than IPv6. Why do you think that world didn't embrace IPv6? It feels like the two of those should have gone really well together. It's a great question. Uh, and I, and I will say that the issues we see are much less in the Kubernetes space and more in the Docker space, which Kubernetes being, I think, slightly newer, at least in adoption, uh, maybe speaks a bit to the point you've made there. But I think a lot of it's just lack of education. Um, even though they are newer than V6, I, I don't think we've seen as big of a push uh, towards V6 as we have been seeing lately. And so while V6 has been around literally since the 90s, um, widespread adoption hasn't been. And so I think that perhaps uh, it comes to the it comes to the fact, like I mentioned earlier, is that my vintage of engineers aren't familiar with end-to-end -end connectivity and things like that. So it's just not an assumption that you have, and it's pretty prevalent in all of uh, Docker's networking concepts. And you know, until like Mac VLAN, for example, there was a lot of odd workarounds you'd have to do to even enable some sort of end-to-end uh, -end connectivity into Docker at all. So I think a lot of it just has to come with the fact that it's a it's a newer technology that was. Uh, perhaps created by folks who did not understand the value of end to end. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll throw a question your way then, Chris. There are an awful lot of programming languages out there. Um, I'm not gonna try and list them all in the question, but the, they're all effectively have APIs to networking, some of which may be good at letting you write IP version independent code. Some may have defaults that prefer v4 use like java typically can do do you have any advice or comments on that in terms of maybe languages that you choose to use or general advice in gotchas in hidden in in the programming language environments yeah it's a good question um i would say that most modern uh modern languages don't seem to have too much uh, disparity between v4 and v6. Um, I use a lot of Python, uh, Go, and some Rust. Uh, those, it's all uh, very flawless. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it comes back to the idea of testing and just making sure that you have tests for your applications that are outside of the language it's written in. And so if you have um, an application written in perhaps an older language or a more legacy language, you know, as long as your tests are there and testing for all these use cases, uh, you, I, I don't think that there's many languages out there that just aren't going to straight support V6. So it might require a little bit more work 
and things to be aware of. But as long as you have good test cases, you can detect those things before before it actually gets released out. Okay, thank you. Any other questions come up? If not, I'll ask one one more. Oh, sorry, Veronica has a question. I've got to throw you the... <laughs> okay, so Chris, last year when we had the debate here, um, if you watch the recording of the 10 years anniversary panel, there was a quite heated debate about how to force or how to persuade, that's probably a better word, how to persuade all the developers to actually start taking IPv6 seriously and start developing in a way that the, actually the networks that we are building with so much effort that they are actually using it. And yeah, the common complaint was about all these virtualized environments, Docker, Kubernetes, etc. They are kind of getting there. So what did, have you seen? I know like the RNA networks, they are a little bit different. The mindset is different, you know, like, you know, Cessnet was deploying IPv6 like 23 years ago in, in Prague when I lived there. Um, so how did you persuade your colleagues? How did you become from network engineer a software developer and embraced IPv6? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that uh, flogging is useful, uh, but in absence of that, <laughs> um, it, it, it can, I think that having good organizational alignment is a big one. So, you know, being able to argue the business case and the cost savings and the troubleshooting ease and things like that uh, to the organization at large as to why this is an initiative, an initiative that should be undertaken is very important. And I think that applies to all levels of the information technology stack. But um, I think being able to actually quantify V6 into a financial thing, especially if you work at a for-profit institution uh, of some sort, that's very important. And then if you get the, the bean counters on your side, it's very easy to then just go, well, this is the way we are doing things. Uh, like you said, it is different in research and education where we will do this because we think it's the right thing to do. But if you're selling a widget of some sort or making a thing, uh, your, your uh, ideological views uh, don't really matter too much past how that influences shareholder value, right? So I think that that's the language you have to really, really put things in to, to make things work. And I, and I do think it's possible to make those arguments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um well, my second question stems from your rather excellent observation about test environments to do the, the development in. You mentioned uh, maybe it was one of your colleagues or, or you were aware of a, a project to make a, a device available that you can plug into the network that presumably tunnels back and provides all these different connection mechanisms. Do you have any advice for people who may be in the audience who are software developers about how they can get into an appropriate environment if they don't have something like that? What, what should they be looking to do? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that really prompted uh, the folks at NU to apply for that grant is that there are a lot of places that say, yeah, we'd love to write this IP6 thing, but we don't have something available. So I would say the first thing you should do is try to make your own test environment locally, right? Um, and, and work towards uh, having a proper test environment because the one that you build purpose built for your tools and for your applications is probably going to be the most well suited for uh, your tools and applications. However, yeah, if you know, if they're able to build this thing with the grant money they received, uh, I do think it's a cool option uh, for organizations that might not have that. And I'm and I'm hoping it's like I said, it's still not been done yet. But uh, I'm hoping that the the lessons they learn from building these things will be available, so that you could perhaps run your own without you know calling somebody to get one of these boxes shipped to you or however they end up making it work. But yeah, definitely look at the the link in the slides towards that. Uh, it is an Aaron grant, so it is, you know, North America focused and Internet 2 is generally North America focused, but I do think it's a, I think it's a cool idea. Okay, and my final question, if there's no more from the audience, I assume you're familiar with Happy Eyeballs. Um, whether you have any comments on that, for some it's a good way of having connectivity work for V4, V6, and giving V6 maybe a slight head start, but for others it can mask problems in the, the network if things have gone down. Um, what's your view on that and advice for software developers? Yeah, I think Happy Eyeballs is, uh, is fine. I don't have problems with it. Um, I think it's good because if there are V6 problems, you don't have to see them. However, like you mentioned, it masks things. So uh, ULA is a great example of this. Um, you know, it can mask ULA problems. Um, it can also mask IPv4 problems, which is nice. Um, but the important thing is it doesn't apply to non-web traffic. So if you are, you know, making calls via other methods uh, and it's not through a browser, then happy eyeballs does not apply to you. And that 
I think if you become too reliant on happy eyeballs, just solving your problems for you, that is a huge problem. And I think that developers should not get too comfortable just assuming that there's always going to be some mechanism that automatically fails over between things for them because uh, eventually it's not going to work, you know. And I've, I've seen this before where like I go to SSH to something and V6 might be broken and, you know, now I have issues SSHing to that device, but I could load it up in my browser and that's very confusing. So be aware that it exists and don't rely only on those, uh, on those solutions that are provided by it. You might okay. make sense. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. So there are no further questions. So again, thank you very much, Chris.